Do I just... Uh, very good. All right, there's a nice little table there. Maybe I meant to sit, but I can't. I can't sit. Um, well, it, this is fantastic. I love the subject, cities in migration. I am an immigrant. I grew up in six languages. I speak none of them perfectly. And when you are a prof, that can get you into some trouble. Uh, but it doesn't matter. In many of our cities, that is the norm. And so I want to start very briefly just by engaging these two subjects, the city and the migrant. Cities, you know, we have had them for a very long time. Think of any of our large cities, you know, cities with a certain level of complexity. They, you know, they have lasted for centuries. Think of the big firms in those cities. Take familiar cities, London, New York. All the big corporations and firms that existed 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, dead. Think of the forms of government, the rulers, the powerful people, the powerful elites, finished. But the city is still there. And most important, the neighborhoods are still there. That is the most amazing thing. Not the big central great palaces, but all those neighborhoods. And when I say neighborhood, I'm thinking of something that is a modest space, not a grand space. Power has a way of being able to, you know, make itself present in many diverse guises, in many diverse forms. But the neighborhoods where modest people live, and th those neighborhoods have existed in any of our big cities. Now, they, you know, different occupants, but there they are. The migrant. So I, I arrived in New York City as a migrant. And I was about 19, and it was a bit of adventure for me. My first job was as a cleaning woman. And that, because that's the easiest job you can get in a big city, frankly. Now, I, I want to clarify, for me, it was a bit of adventure. I don't want to present myself as a little martyr here. Huh? The other women in my group, we were sort of a group, were mostly Afro-Caribbean. They were from the Caribbean. And they were older than I was. They all had fairly significant educations. None of them, none of us, neither me, felt that the space that we occupied cleaning woman. That's hard work, right? I really got tired eventually, huh? But anyhow, that space, that that space marked us. We could not be reduced to that space, and I think this holds for all migrants. The outsider may look at the migrant and say, hmm, that's what they are. Oh no, that's not. That's one kind of space. Little vignette connecting migrant city, etc. I'm developing an app which captures the knowledges of people present in immigrant communities in New York City. Because you can have an immigrant who is just, you know, barely managing, doing a very simple job, parking lot attendant, who's a doctor, who's a lawyer, lives in a low-income community in a place like New York, the community should know the knowledges present in their neighborhood. Not just see the parking lot attendant, but know about the person. The grandmothers very often have knowledge about plants and medicines that the fancy doctor in the big hospital does not. The community should know that. So what, what, what I think happens in our complex cities is, am, am I hearing sounds that you are also hearing or not? Is this, is this better? There is some inter... I'm really sorry about that. Can you hear me better this way? Is this better? Okay, good. Um, so, the, the, you know, we should really, we should really connect at other, through other vectors with immigrants. And I say this also because the immigrant marks that person as somehow whatever. 
I did a big project where, years ago where I looked at Europe. I looked at 200 years of internal migrations in Europe. At that point, the foreigner, the outsider, was basically your cousin. That foreigner arriving at these European towns, and the towns were the main issue, was, and that you know, same religion, same phenotype, same basic language group, that foreigner was seen as an outsider. Those foreigners had to fight to get into those cities, to be accepted in those cities. Today, we look at the foreigner and see cultural distance, religious distance, and say, these migrations are difficult, they're different, there is fear, there is lack of knowledge, there is projection. I just want to remind us Europeans that 200 years ago, when the foreigner was our cousin, we reacted the same way. Little story that in a way also connects city and migration. When von Hausmann, Baron von Hausmann was rebuilding Paris, he needed some more workers. He knew that French workers in the south of France, in the salt works, had actually attacked and killed Italian workers for being the wrong Catholics or whatever. He was very careful. He selected German and Belgian workers, Catholic. Guess what? When those workers came to Paris, the workers in France said, wrong Catholics. Today, we really ha are, I think, misinterpreting, in a way, this question of distance. When we think that Muslims or whatever, you know, very different types of nationalities and religions. But the question is, are we actually reacting? I don't mean we here. We here might be beautiful and, you know, have it all right, but generally. Are we reacting like those French and they were nice French workers. I'm not putting them down. They were nice French. They, no, no, wrong Catholics. We can't work with that. You know, so we really must go back into our history. Today, we have a planetary space where a lot of this happens. But when we didn't have a planetary space, when it was like our, you know, our little space, we actually had very similar reactions. And the, the, the sadness, the tragic of, is that by producing this distance, because we make that distance. Because they are men, women, and children. They need food, they need to sleep, they need where to put down their body. They are basically just like us. They just weren't born when we, where we are. But the risk is that today we really misinterpret. We need to go back to that original point. Now, so, so much so, I want to position the migrant figure, right? And the second, the second item about migrants, migrations are made. They don't just happen. They don't fall from the sky. There are conditions that emerge that explain those migrations. So, um, for instance, one, one question that I have asked myself, especially vis-à-vis -vis the United States, which is a very particular kind of country. We know, you know, they're continuously at war, in one war or another. But I think that many of the migrations that came to the United States did not start in the moment that the migrant leaves her home. They started in the boardroom of the Pentagon. You, you know what I'm saying, right? Many of the migrations in Germany, uh, the ones that began to come, you know, well, not just Germany, but Germany was particularly strong in this after World War II, they were organized by enterprises and by the government of Germany. When I look at the migrants coming today, of course, you know we have war, the war zones, refugees. Then we have the traditional migrants. They come in search of a better life, job. And then we have another kind of migrant. And this is a subject that I'm very interested in. And there it's more ambiguous. When you have war, 
it's not ambiguous. You know why they're coming. But that third subject, those who are coming from certain places where there is no war, we don't know how to call them, we call them migrants. Are they migrants? There is an ambiguity there. But also those migrants, they're not simply in search of a better life. They're actually in search of bare life because their habitat is finished. It's a plantation, it's a mine, etc. So there are three different subjects when we're dealing with today in migrants. All three, except maybe for the regular familiar migrant, where it might be less significant, but all three are produced by conditions that are larger than those individuals. And that is why when you really look at the world, except for a few little countries, most migrations represent a minority, a small, small percentage of the countries where they come from. They, so most people do not migrate. And then we need to ask, why do some migrate? When you have war, you have a clear explanation. The migrants that begin a new migration, you don't have a clear explanation. Once it's routinized, once you have a certain migrant group in a city, then you have what we call chain migration. Think of chain migration as a bridge. Oh, there is a bridge here. Yeah, I'm going to try to go to New York City. Why not? That's not the most interesting question. The interesting question is why does a migration begin? What does it take for people to go where there is no bridge. They have to build the bridge. And so you have to think of the migrant as a strong subject. She's strong. All of us, we, I was the youngest, we were strong. We could not be flattened to that workspace that we had, which was cleaning. And so these, that, that is what needs explanation. Why does a migration begin? Now, again, with war, we have very clear reasons. These new migrations that are happening, and I'm going to talk a bit about that later, they really need, we need to explain that. And one explanation that I have, just to give you a sense, is something that I call a massive loss of habitat. And that is due to the expansion of mining. Think the seven key new elements that we need for our electronic revolution, as we might call it. That's a new kind of mining. That is brutal mining also because it's not developed, it doesn't have a long history. That is killing land all over. A lot of those materials, by the way, those elements, are probably in the ground right here beneath Prague or beneath Berlin or beneath New York. But are we going to tear down our cities to get at those minerals? Not yet. So where do we go? We go to where we can do that. But this type of mining is producing vast destructions and it produces expulsions of people. Land grabs. 15 countries, uh, governments, and about 100 plus corporations. In the last few years, they have bought over 300 million. Bought is maybe not the term, acquired control. Over 300 million hectares of land, where there is rural land. To do what? To grow plants for biofuels, for food, and to extract water. Nestle and Coca-Cola go around the world buying land. And then they only leave after they have taken out all the water. They have succeeded in the United States, besides all kinds of other places to exhaust, to exhaust the water supplies of two areas in Texas, one area in Michigan. In New York, they tried, and the governor said, out, Coca-Cola, out, out. They went to California. In California, they have managed to, ex to exha exhaust the water supply of one place. When you do that, you're actually also expelling people. You are expelling possibilities for livelihood. So one has to see this third type of migrant, which is not the historic migrant, it's not me as I was, nor is it the war refugee. This is a different kind of migrant. And this is a migrant who does not leave a home behind. 
This is not a strong subject. This is a fragile subject, a subject that has been thrown out of her little plot of land and has to, what happens, what's the first move? They go to the big cities in the region. And there we look at them and we say, urban slum dwellers. We lose that first step that they were small holders. By small holder, I mean that they run a little bit of agricultural space, etc., or all kinds of other activities like that. Maybe they owned a little uh, brick-making factory. You know, they, they had lives. They made economies. But then come the land grabbers and the mines and the plantations, throw into that today climate change. Desert, some land becomes desert, some land becomes a flood. And what is the first step that they take? They disappear in the slums. And we then see them as slum dwellers. We break a bit of knowledge out of our you know, examination, if you want. The fact that they actually made economies and they managed the land in a way that the land could have a long life. So to me, this third subject is extremely important. And this third subject has no legal regime that recognizes it. This is a subject that when she appears at our borders, you can't invoke UNHCR, the refugee regime, nor can you invoke the regular migration laws that, you know, every country has sort of a mix of some kind of migration law. Because she's not really a migrant. She is a refugee, but she's an economic refugee. And we don't have that. And what does it mean? It means that we have to govern the mines, the water grabbers, the land grabbers, those who are destroying terrain, water bodies and land mass. We don't have a regime. We need that. And this is, I think, one of the big struggles. Now to the city. And then I also want to show some slides. Um, so, in the Middle Ages, if you were walking around the hills of Italy and you saw a kind of density, built density, you knew that's a city. Today, Maybe, yes, in Prague. You see Prague, man, it's a city. But in many cities, when you see a lot of density, you can't assume it's a city. You have to interrogate. You have to actually say, okay, what am I seeing? If it's a private mega project marked by huge densities, it's not a city. Not in my vocabulary. We call it city. But we should be careful. So I think of the city, and I should say that in my practice, I need to sort of remove myself from the object of study till the point where I have to crawl back to recognize it. So I can't just say, the city is a city. A lot of descriptions of the city basically come down to that. It may not look that way, but they are basically saying, the city is a city. That doesn't work for me. And I think we should really take this seriously. Because the city, historically, as I said, is an extraordinary animal that has outlived all kinds of other systems of power. So one way of thinking of the city is that the city is a complex but incomplete space, condition, entity. In that mixity of complexity and incompleteness lies the capacity of cities to outlive far more formalized entities. Kings, queens, corporations, you know, act powerful actors. And that's extraordinary. And as I repeat what I said at the beginning, because I really think it matters when you're going to be focusing on immigrants. And that is what, what is important here, it seems to me, is that the neighborhoods. When I say neighborhood, I mean a modest space. Most spaces in a city tend to be that, modest, not the grand visual. Now, today, you know, our cities are 
amazing animals, huge, etc., dynamic, and I don't know what all. But they are also encroached, and I'll show you some data on this, by a corporatizing of urban space, a privatizing that I argue de-urbanizes the city. So we are at a very particular juncture. I think this historic moment, especially because of the, the, the loss of habitat that I described earlier, this is a very particular moment. This is not an easy moment. This is a great challenge. It's not like the industrial era where a city like Chicago needed to bring in masses of workers. The poor neighborhoods were the spaces where those immigrants could come as the middle classes left the city. It's, we are not in that epoch. This is a very different epoch. Now, I'm hoping that the slides work. I want to start now describing the threats. The threats in terms of, you know, one very simple language is corporatizing of urban space. This, you can read very quickly, those of you who are interested, you don't need to read it. This is an instrument, brilliant instrument, developed by finance, and fi which produced 14 million households out of their homes in about 10 years. And it's now entered this brilliant instrument, Europe. This is, as I said, a financial instrument. It was made, constructed by, through algorithmic math. This is not microeconomics, nothing to do with microeconomics. It's the math of physicists. If you take just a vignette now, a moment, if you take a firm like Goldman Sachs, I'm sure many of you, most of you have heard about it, the back room, which is the space where the secretaries used to sit, the back room had a hundred plus physicists. The instrument took 16 extraordinarily complex steps. It's brilliant. What was it used for? To extract a piece of material. It could be a door, a toilet, a wall, mix it up with incredibly fanciful and very high grade, in other words, highly respected, uh, uh, you know, finance, money, debt, whatever it might be. But you could sell it, you financier could sell it as an asset-backed security. What did it take? It took, and I give you here an ethnographic moment, every week, each of the intermediary agents that had to secure a signing on a document by modest, mostly modest people who thought they were getting a home, they had to get 500, for the system to work, 500 signatures. Yeah, you can own this home. You don't have to pay me anything, nothing, nothing now. Five, six years you have, just sign. And they did. In seven years, 15 million plus such documents were signed. So the image is an army of intermediary agents extracting signatures. I repeat, minimum each one, 500 a week. That's hard work. Sign. And here is the outcome. These are the data from our central bank. 14 plus million households out of their home, 10 years, you have to stand back and you say, wow, that's a capability. And I'm using the term capability clearly as a variable, but that is a capability. Now, these are foreclosures, all of them according to the central bank, they're out of their house. Now, I want to take a Pythagorean moment here. What is 14 million households? Well, it's at least 30 million people, 40 million people in their full materiality, it's invisible. This is something we cannot see. This is a geography, this is a series of events we cannot see. I'm Dutch, so I sort of use as an experimental illustration some voice from up there in the Netherlands saying, okay, all of you on the territory of the Netherlands, out. That's 16 million people. And now we repeat the exercise. Then you get 30, 35, 40 million people. 
And then it's still not enough. So this is one of the issues that has really intrigued me, and you'll see when I move to other aspects of the city today, that the material is not quite telling us the full story. And we tend to think that if it's material, it is what it is. You know, what, I mean, what's the issue? And I want to juxtapose this notion that the material does not tell us the full story It's what I said at the beginning about the immigrant, the immigrant subject, we in our cleaning space, we could not be reduced to that cleaning space. But all the outsider sees is a cleaning woman. That migrant is a cleaning woman. So I'm just, again, the materiality of it all. Now, Europe thinks it doesn't have this problem, and I don't know why, I sort of find it a bit ironic slash funny. Germany is has the highest foreclosures. This is an invisible story. Right now, the, by the way, the data go on. So we have over a million households in Germany, a country where most people rent. So this is, that million is actually doubly significant. Out of their homes. That again, that can be two million people, three million, invisible. Nobody knows it. This is a brilliant instrument. Those physicists in the back rooms of those banks in Manhattan, They produce an extraordinary instrument. Now, a lot of these people who are thrown out of their homes, you know, we just don't see them. We don't know that who they are. We, they, we, they may be sitting across from us in a, in, a, in, a, in a food place. We don't know the history. And so I think inside our cities, we, those who were born in our cities, we who have been expelled, we are becoming that third type of subject that you can't quite call a migrant, even though we're using the term migrant, nor can you call her a refugee. We are generating inside our cities those types of subjects. And so I want transversalities. I think we need to stop accepting existing explanations. We've got to begin to check out what the hell is happening here. Now, I have the impression about Prague, by the way, this is a beautiful city. It looks like everything is perfect here. I'm sure it is not, by the way, but you know, it looks perfect. So, and I know enough about the, I must say in my, in my latest book, this is one of the big issues, uh, how the material tells us only so much. And the question that I have in today's world where, this belongs to another subject, where intermediation is this very elaborate uh, condition that marks us all, to what extent in a lot of situations, we're not quite getting the heart of the story. Now, I need to see a clock because I don't have any idea how long I have spoken. I'm terrible. Now, the outcome of all of that is empty urban land. So what I want to do next is put us all on alert as to some of the issues that are happening, all right? And so one of the issues that is happening is a lot of buying of property by big by big buyers. I'm not talking little cute house. And, um, and this again, in its full materiality, this is a pretty invisible story. So I am looking at the top 100 cities in the world that are the destination of this type of buying. And it's both foreign and national. The reason I'm focusing on it, because this is something that takes pieces of the city and actually puts them in another circuit. We, the passers-by, don't see the difference, but the difference has happened. In other words, we are not just having to confront a difficult migration situation, we also are beginning to confront a difficult urban. And again, I hope that this generates sort of transversal solidarities. And I'll show you some figures here. Now, this is only buying property. And, and just to, and I'm looking at a hundred cities, I can clearly put the hundred here. And, um, and this is annual. This is a story that really begins in the last two or three years. So from mid-2013 to mid-2014, over 600 billion, that's quite a few zeros. I don't know, I know that this term always changes a bit. <coughs> were were uh, invested in buying property. <coughs> this is not site development, this is just buying existing property. Minimum price, if we use New York as a standard, uh, is five million. 
So it's not, you know, a cute little whatever. It's serious stuff. And here you begin to see the distribution. Now imagine 100. And 100 cities are actually quite a few cities. I mean, they're clearly big cities. Um, now, this is foreign money. So foreign, London ranks at the top. By the way, for me, the issue that it is foreign or national is really secondary. And it comes back to these differentiations that I have been making, that some of us are becoming internal migrants because we keep getting thrown out of our homes, etc. We can't afford to buy a home, etc. So that, you know, getting out of the silos through which we have understood a lot of our conditions and just cutting across. And I use in, in this new book of mine, I say, we need to sort of go back to ground level, bring it all down, all those fancy terms that come either from the corporate world or from the academic world, bring it down to ground level and then check it out. Huh? So I argue, for instance, well, I'll, I'll get to that later. So, so now, back to this then. So many people say, and here comes again this issue of how we explain and how we describe conditions. They say, well, it's gentrification. You know gentrification, that term, right? Well, yeah, it's partly gentrification. But when you invoke a category like that, it's actually an invitation not to think. Say, oh, yeah, it's gentrification. And so I don't buy that it is simply gentrification. And let me just give you one little example. And again, the fact that it's foreign or national to me is truly secondary. What matters is that it's corporate. Huh? So the Qatari royals now own more of central London than the Queen of England. Now you can see why, number one, one need not worry about this bit, right? Both of them are very rich royal households and what the hell, they can do what they want. What one does want to worry is about the capacity to acquire urban land. So I'm doing a study for Habitat where I argue that what I'm seeing here is not simply the buying of property. And those properties are often empty. This is something else. And so I'm sort of exploring a hypothesis that says this is, this is actually the buying of urban land. And that is very different. Property is one thing. Land is another. When you look at the legislation, the law, about ownership of land, it gets very wobbly. These are very old regimes. And what I am afraid of is that the contracts made by those acquiring the properties, and they are brilliant minds, and they have the best lawyers, and very innovative lawyers, and you know, creative lawyers, so to say, that they will start making the law about urban land. And that is not a good idea. I don't know if you are still with me here. But um, I just want to move on. So here again this. Now, back to the material. So what does this all look like, all this property? And so here is an image from London. So this is central London. There is the Thames, you see that. All of these properties, except maybe, they're actually very, it's very good taste. You know, they're very nice, except maybe that one over there that, that are not so nice. But anyhow. They are, you know, you walk past them, the tourists walk past them and say, what wonderful British houses. Well, ladies and gentlemen, they're all owned by one Chinese company. It's invisible. Now, on some level that it is foreign or not, it doesn't matter, but there is something about massive ownership of so much. Another big foreign company just bought 12 Rachthäuser, you know, in, the, in Amsterdam, these big, and, uh, and you don't see it. But the Dutch found out, of course, you know, and they're pretty alarmed. But why one is alarmed? One needs to know why one is alarmed. That also happens to be a Chinese company. Now, when you take those 100 cities that I was looking at, they account for 10% of the world's population, 30% of the world's GDP. That's far too much. That's not good. GDP should be produced in multi-sited, multiple environments, not that much in 100 cities. And 76% of property investment, I don't know where that fits in, but the GDP number is alarming. Now, there is another story 
that, that, but I really need to know how much time I have. I don't see a clock. I only see a zero. Did I use my time up? Okay, so this is inventing housing markets, etc. I want to move on. So why does some of this stuff matter? Because, you know, when I want to sort of bring it down at ground level, why does it really matter? I think that, and I go back to the start, that the city is a space where historically those without power get to make a history. And that matters. And you see it today. Our big cities, nobody, no matter how powerful a government it is, no matter how militarized, can fully control urban space. The plantations, the big plantations, in the 1800s, in the 1700s, were the spaces where those without power could make a history. Because you had such a concentration of mostly men. And, you know, and so capoeira, we all know that story, which looks like a dance, is a martial art of the slaves of the plantation. Today, the plantations are militarized, the mines are militarized. So what was historically the site where those without power could make a history, today is the city. Second point, I think that when I ask myself, where is the frontier today? And I think of the frontier space as a space where actors from different worlds have an encounter for which there are no established rules of engagement. Now, in, the, in the, our imperial epoch, the frontier was the edge of empire, and we just killed them or whatever, we enslaved them. Today, the only real frontier, given all the land grabs, is in our big cities. And in our big cities, you know, those without power get to make a history, get to be present. And I love this image that comes from, I grew up in Latin America, from Latin America, the fighting poor in Latin America, you know, estamos presentes, we're present. Power, we're not asking you for anything, we're just letting you know, this is also our city. And that is what historically has made the difference about this type of space and has made the difference for migrants. Now, second point, there is a way, there are moments of every day when a city is able to make us all into urban subjects. Not middle class, not upper class, not lower class, not poor, not religion, not race, not etc. All urban subjects. And one, one image is, of course, rush hour. You know, we all, etc., etc. Et um, and final point here. I, one of the things that I really have worked on, and I love this, it's sort of a bit theoretical, I ask myself, does the city have speech? Speech, you know, in the full sense of that term. Does it actually have capacity to, to speak to us? Yes, I think it does. But we don't know that language anymore. So every now and then, you see, and the, the simplest little example, just very quickly, is, um, is the, um, take a beautiful car, you know, made for super speed and highways and I don't know what. When it arrives in a crowded city center, all those capabilities are neutralized. It just crawls. I say, the city has spoken. You see what I'm getting at, right? When you begin to look at it that way, you know, I, I really have, I wrote an article that I loved, you know, which I call, Does the City Have, the city have Speech? Um, when you look at it that way, then you know that it is an interaction. So I want to give you a story that illustrates this. In New York City, there is a park that now is a beautiful park, but that, uh, you know, in the 1980s was very dangerous, Riverside Park. And um, the 1980s is a time when New York City gets a lot of immigrants from sort of Latin America, etc. But it also, and that went sort of beneath the radar screen, there were two population groups that want to go to New York City. One is the immigrant, and the other one was native-born Americans with very high levels of education. Why? Because they were beginning to cater this emergent financial system that in had installed itself in what was seen by most people writing about New York as, you know, the big corporations leaving, the big insurance companies leaving, etc., etc. Now, these people, some of them bought houses, beautiful houses, on that park. 
And that park was dangerous at that point. What do you do when you have a dangerous situation like that in a city like New York? Well, they bought dogs. I mean, these dogs are like little horses. You know, they are huge. They're terrifying. Those dogs are more terrifying than a gun. They, they are absolutely terrifying. So, and a dog needs to be walked every day, right? I mean, at 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., whatever. And so what you had was what I call a collaboration between urban space and these individuals. Let's assume they were all selfish. They just wanted to make money and finance, whatever. And so they have to walk the dogs. As they walk the dogs, those dogs are so terrifying that some of the muggers and all of that began to move away. What you have... It's like, to me, it's like the resolution of the prisoner's dilemma, for those of you who are into that kind of stuff. Because these guys, selfish as, and they were Muslim men, selfish as they were, they actually enabled the park to become again uh, a reasonable park where some other people began to come, like mothers with children. And, and, and I argue that urban space was an actor in enabling that. You see that with immigrant communities. They come into very poor, degraded parts of the city. Again, let's imagine they're all selfish. They all want their little yard to be neat and their little house to be the neatest of the block. By the time they are done, they have collectively upgraded a whole neighborhood. And that, again, the urban space makes that possible. You can't achieve that, you know, in some rural area in a way. So. To think of the city as being able to hack is extremely important. Now, I was going to give you some stunning... Uh, uh, I, my argument is that we're living in an epoch of a logic of extraction. There is no time for that. I want to very quickly give you a final set of issues. And one way of looking at it is loss of habitat. You already heard me say that. I won't describe it again. Look at this. In 20 years... This took 20 years. This didn't fall from the sky, the total destruction of the RLC. This did not fall from the sky. We made that. That's not a particularly admirable capability, you know what I'm saying. Nor is it particularly complex. In fact, with my son, who is a wild artist, we're, we're developing a project. He's sort of a brilliant digital type. Uh, how we have deployed biocodes that are quite elementary, but produce massive destructions. Can we actually develop biocodes that are also quite elementary, you know, but have a positive sort of thing? This is even more impressive. A billion years, gone in 20 years. And you really have to think about it as a capability, clearly not a la Martia Sen. This is an ambiguous capability, but it is a capability. Now, I'm, this is the, I'm talk, talking loss of habitat very quickly. These are some data about buying of land. Buying of land means you expel millions of people. The estimate is that between two and three million people are being expelled from their rural areas by the expansion of mining, the expansion of, uh, of this kind of plantation agriculture, by water grabs, and by what I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the climate change. That's a lot of people. I remind you, first step is they go to the slums of the cities. There, their history and the knowledge contained in that is lost to us. The observer only sees more slum dwellers. The observer does not see loss of habitat. And then a lot of this is biofuels, which means they can use all the pesticides they want, which means huge shadow effect in terms of killing land. Uh, these are all the areas in the, in the world that are already in deep trouble. The United States is one of them. So you're going to see a lot of migrations that are not produced by war, etc., but just by these kinds of things. If we today implemented everything that is sort of a policy bit, I always say policy is not going to get us very far, this is the difference, you understand? That's almost zero, because it still grows. I hope that is clear. Um, now, I am right now doing, and I have a very long, very boring, very detailed, but lots of data paper that I'm very happy to, to post on the website. I'm looking at three of these new types of migrations that I argue are produced by that loss of habitat. And um, I think we have to take them seriously. I think this tells us about an emergent new history and geography. And we don't have language.
to capture that. They are refugees, but they are kind of ironic economic refugees. In those countries where suddenly you have huge plantations, where before you had small agricultural setups, where they protected the land, etc., in those um, in those countries, uh, yes, I, I got it. Um, you know, in, in these are countries where the earth is now going to die much more quickly. This is really, you know, these are beginnings that are pretty alarming. Now. I'm also looking at the question of violence, urban violence. So we have, besides all the migrations in Central America, we also have one of unaccompanied children. And we don't know how many die. They come mostly from Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala, from the big cities there. According to the international data, those three cities are the most violent places in the world. When we get a chance to speak with these children, they have one answer. I'm afraid. It's not about, these are not migrants. But nor are they refugees. They're not qualified as refugees. So that's one of them. And you can see the Mexicans going down. Again, this is too quickly now to show you. But I wanted to get to the other one. So we have had the Mediterranean as the theater of tragic events, of etc. The Andaman Sea in, you know, Indonesia, Thailand, I don't know if you have in Malaysia, etc., had, had the same stories. The West just didn't pick up on them. At one point, you had 7,000 people that were counted because the journalists got into the picture. 7,000 people in a, a large number of floating boats piled over. Some of them sank. Many people died just out of dehydration. So, and these also, so people say, this is Muslim persecution in Myanmar. No, no, it's not. That, that is an old Muslim community in Myanmar that has existed for centuries. What's happened in Myanmar? Myanmar opened its doors and in came the corporations and the mining corporations and that is what is happening and they're displacing in fact more natives than etc. And now I have to end. I have all these great maps here. Uh, Europe, we know that story. I'm just hoping that with your brilliant minds, you can put together the two or three elements that organized my tale here, and that you can see that, you know, we, we, this is a complex issue. It is not more of the same. This time, as somebody said, it's different. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saskia.